So first of all, I just want to say a few thank yous. First to God and to my family, my wife, my two teenage daughters, uh, for giving me stability and a life. And then I want to zoom down from the macro to the micro. I'm going to be doing a lot of that. Uh, and thank uh, uh, Daniel and Meredith for uh, arranging for me to be here and sort of more broadly the Department of Cultural Affairs for supporting all of this and I hope they continue to do that and expand and specifically supporting this uh, research activity that I had done with, with Daniel and others that Meredith alluded to. So um, I want to introduce myself just a little more to give you a sense of where I'm coming from. And then the rest of this talk is absolutely made up. Last night before I went to bed, I thought to myself, you know, I'm very busy during the days and I got the teenage daughters. They have a dance competition tonight, you know, so I have almost no spare time. Uh, Daniel suggested I do this several weeks back and I thought, OK, maybe I can talk about something interesting uh, and I'll try to put something together. And so I collected a bunch of stuff. I have six different brainstorming files, none of which I went back to read. <laughs> And I collected a ton of materials I could show you. Uh, anybody who knows me knows this is what I do. And in the end, I don't know what the heck I'm going to talk about. I got sort of a general guidelines. And more importantly, what was happening a few minutes ago, I think, is the best. I'm happy to like start up a conversation and then hang out while we ask questions. Because that, you know, that's the core of curiosity, is asking questions. But I am going to try to say something about curiosity. And uh, again, when I was thinking at the last minute, uh, Daniel said, you've got to send me a title. And I'm like, what do I do? So. Um, I just came up with, you know, Curiosity Killed the Cat and then Schrodinger's Cat, two different things in my head. So I just put them together and I said, God will help me figure out how to come up with a talk based on that later. And so far, she's been quiet. I don't have a talk, so I'm just going to make it up. So, um, and he's going to help me. Duality. Um, so I just want to give you a little bit more about my background. So yeah, I, was, uh, I, I wanted to be an electrical engineer originally. I got waitlisted at RPI, and their hockey rival Clarkson happened to have an open spot. And I went up there one day, and I saw everybody playing Frisbee, and the grass was green, and the sun was shining. It's like, oh, I'll go here. Yeah, that was the basis of a very deep decision. So I went to Clarkson. Um, and uh, I, again, I had been into computers already from high school, and I, I liked electronics as a kid, so I thought I'm going to be an electrical engineer. But I, I, I got waitlisted on the engineering program at Clarkson also, and they said, don't worry, we'll, we'll flunk out a bunch of uh, proto engineers, and then you can switch. We'll stick in physics, and you can switch back over to engineering after your first semester. This is not unheard of, right? So, um, but meanwhile, I discovered two things. One is I actually love physics, and the other is that the engineering curriculum, even back then, and I'm sure it's worse now, is so prescribed that they don't give you very many electives. And I was still trying to explore the computer side of life. So I said, well, I'll stick with physics because they allow me to choose more courses in computing. And those two have wound themselves together throughout my career, although, because as one of the lessons I'll tell you is curiosity certainly can kill a cat and it can kill a person's career too. If you get interested in too many things and you don't focus, you are a research professor instead of a tenured professor. You are this or that or the other thing. I mean, one of, one of the, one of the uh, senior professors at UNM pointed out to me once, he said, you know, Tim, you, you did it exactly backwards. The way you're supposed to become a tenured professor is you're supposed to focus like a laser beam on some tiny little area, battle your way through the tenure process, and then when you're stable, you can broaden out. And I did it backwards and that kind of curiosity killed part of the cat in my career. But I'm still having fun. As I say, I'm very thankful. I wouldn't trade my life with anybody's. So I'm delighted to be here and try to run through a few quick things. Now, the other side of curiosity kills Schrodinger's cat. Schrodinger's cat relates to quantum mechanics. And quantum mechanics is something that's been around for over 100 years. And the story leading up to its uh, invention or discovery, depending on how you think about it, is uh, like most stories, at least in physics, and probably most stories entirely, is quite tangled and it's never quite clear where it's going ahead of time. But I would venture, based on some conversations I've had with colleagues of mine at the university very recently, in particular uh, Professor Carl Caves, and he's quite famous in gravitational wave uh, physics, among many other things, information physics, quantum physics, quantum information. Um, there is a book that I'll show you in a moment that came out very early that details all the deep thinking that the early quantum physicists went through trying to understand what the implications of quantum mechanics are. And I'm going to go ahead, I'm not a world authority on this, but based on the research I did preparing for this talk, I'm going to go ahead and guess that 100 years later, we still really don't understand it. And I'll come back to that a little bit later, but let me tell you a little bit more about myself and how computing and, 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 uh, and uh, physics have emerged in my life. So here happens to be a tab that I left up on my 6,000 tabs in my three browsers somewhere. I, I, I destroy computers. Every computer for me is a supercomputer, and they all crash. My definition of a supercomputer is one that's down most of the time and only 10% efficient when it's up. That defines my laptop as well as some computers I work with elsewhere. So um, uh, here we have uh, some tab. Uh, that was pointing back at Brookhaven. I used to do some work at Brookhaven. I was a, a postdoc working there. At Brookhaven Lab is in Long Island, New York, for those of you who may not know. And they, they specialize in what are called, well, all of this stuff 
is studied in one form or another by smashing atoms, so to speak. So everybody's heard of atom smashers, right? Uh, okay, so I'm going to go off on the first of many discursions. I meant to ask, how many people in this audience can remember ever doing a one-dimensional integral? Just raise your hand. One-dimensional integral. If you know what that is and you remember doing one, raise your hand. A one-dimensional integral. A 1D integral. Or, you know, you can do a simple derivative. How many, how many hands? Just, just shoot them up. Okay, because people who do derivatives don't hold their hands up very often. They're usually shy. So um, what I see is that now, how many people have ever written an article of any kind for anything? Newspaper, newspaper. Oh, look at that. Okay, so now I know something about my audience. I was going to ask who's an artist, who's an engineer, but, you know, that's not a good kind of question. It's too simplistic. But if you've done a one-dimensional integral, you might be an engineer, you might be a scientist, or maybe you were a, uh, a journalist who was just damn going to do a one-dimensional integral, but most likely, it, it, so I have a sense of my audience now, and I don't want to be too technical, probably because I can't be. I'm an experimentalist, by the way. I mean, if you give me a, a wrench or a soldering iron or a computer, I can do something. If you put a math book in front of me, my head hits it immediately and I'm asleep. But philosophy I like, but philosophy is not mathematics, and mathematics is not physics either. So um, I'm an experimentalist, and more and more in my life, I'm becoming a phenomenologist. Uh, I tend to trust theory of all types, whether it's political ideologies, or 15-dimensional, 11-dimensional superstrings. It's not that I'm not saying they're not there. I'm not saying the mathematics is not extremely profound, very complicated, and, and one of the best inventions of humankind. I'm saying I don't understand it, and if I had to base my life on an 11-dimensional uh, string, I'd be in big trouble. I could barely tie my shoes. So, um, so as an experimentalist, I did work in the field of uh, experimental particle physics. And in particle physics, it's atom smashers. You smash things together. Uh, Feynman once said, uh, the way it's done is if you have a Swiss watch, Swiss watch and you want to know how it works and what its parts are made of, you get another Swiss watch, you get two people to throw the two Swiss watches at each other, and you hope, you're going to have to repeat this often, because mostly you're going to hit nothing, sometimes you're going to hit the other person. Occasionally, the two Swiss watches will hit head on. And when they do, they're going to blow up and the parts are going to come flying out, and if you're good with your camera and whatever other detecting equipment you have, you'll see springs and gears and God knows what flying out, and you'll capture it and you'll look at it and you'll say, okay, what was it we just threw together? That's what particle physics does. It's just that we do it with elementary particles. My PhD experiment was done on a, an experiment called AMI in Japan, and which, by the way, the funny story behind how I went to Japan, and I can tell it's offline, but bottom line is I wouldn't trade the experience for anything, but it was another destroyer of my career. Because <laughs> um, I spent two extra years getting my PhD because I was actually overseas in a somewhat foreign environment. But I love Japan, I love the Japanese, and I would not trade my experience there for anything. Um, Amy was a detector that was on a, an atom smasher that was actually colliding electrons. Electrons are the particles that come out of the wall socket when you plug in anything that you plug in. And even though we think of electricity as being a little dangerous, something that's up on the poles or maybe buried in the street and everything we use nowadays in our lives runs on it, electricity is a flow of electrons. Electrons, as far as we know, in theory and in experiment for sure, are actually elementary particles. It's, it's, a, it's a member of the first so-called generation of elementary particles. So electrons are actually a big deal, and you, they get to be a bigger deal when you hit them together at very high energy. And that's what we were doing at the Tristan facility at KK in Japan um, back in the uh, late 80s. And since electrons are elementary particles, certain kinds of things come flying out. I later, when I first came here as a postdoc at the university, I worked on an experiment called CDF, which was taking place at the Tevatron, which is in Fermilab in Chicago, Illinois. And that one is not colliding electrons, it's colliding protons. Protons are a constituent of the nucleus, they're actually made of things. I'll show a picture in a minute. Um, when you collide those things, two things happen. One is stuff inside gets, hits, stuff inside one hits the whole of the other one, or stuff inside each of them hits each other, or they miss completely. And again, stuff comes flying out, and you have to analyze the stuff and figure out what the two watches were coming in. And then most recently, and that's why I have this one up, I was a um, research scientist with the Relativistic Heavy Ion Collider, or uh, uh, on the he Relativistic Heavy Ion Collider project at Brookhaven National Lab, which is out on Long Island, on the far eastern end of Long Island. And I was on the so-called Phoenix Experiment, which is not spelled like the city. It stands for Pioneering High Energy Nuclear Interaction Experiment. And when you run experiments like that, you have great students like this person who's written up in this article. And I'll, um, uh, I can't see it, but Dennis. So I didn't know Dennis, because this is long after I'd left the experiment. But I was reading up, trying to keep up with what was going on. And here was a nice picture somewhere of atom smashers. Um, here's a big one. I was a collaborator on the Atlas experiment for a little while. That's the big one in CERN in Europe. 
And if you've heard of the Higgs boson, which is a big discovery in the last few years, the Higgs boson was discovered uh, at that facility. It would have been probably been discovered here in the United States had the government not canceled the superconducting supercollider project. Remember Waxahachie, Texas, 52 miles around. Politicians canceled it. Europeans found the Higgs boson. Keep that kind of thing in mind when you think about voting. Um, but that's the Atlas experiment, okay? Um, and the Atlas experiment, that is, or is that CMS? Goodness, see, the problem is, I was on the experiment, but I never actually visited it. It was 200 feet down behind security. I went to the lab once because I was doing computing work, never saw the experiment. This one is Phoenix, with all the parts taken off. And I'm trying to find a person here. There's a person. So this experiment is quite large. I want to say it's 50,000 tons of steel in addition to many hundreds of thousands of channels of electronics. Um, this one is smaller and has a funny shape, and most of the electronics is missing. It's kind of opened up, and a person is actually probably about that big. So this is the kind of stuff I've worked on, and all of these experiments are doing the same thing. They're smashing stuff together to see some aspect of what the interactions are. In the case of this, we weren't smashing protons anymore. Now we're smashing gold nuclei. So the people at Brookhaven were specialists at stripping all the electrons off, or most of them, off nuclei using the charged handle that that ion represented to accelerate it to very high energies and then pass it into the system and let two gold nuclei collide. That's about 200 protons per, per nucleus. So it's a real mess. And in fact, uh, somewhere here I thought I had a picture. But um, you've seen, you've seen, I'm not going to look up a picture, you've seen these pictures of stuff coming in and stuff flying out. And when you collide heavy ions, a lot of stuff flies out. And you need a lot of big computers to analyze the data. And that gets me back over to computers. That's how I got involved in computing. So you need supercomputers to do the theoretical calculations that are connected with these kinds of observations. And you need pretty powerful supercomputers just to assemble the data and uh, turn it into some kind of a message about what parts are coming out of the Swiss watch collision. Okay? So this has been my background. And it involves both physics, specifically experimentation, and big computers. And so in my career, after I came to UNM, so I was a postdoc, then I was a research scientist, and one day I was trying to get some of these big calculations done to help analyze these experiments. And I'm one of a team of hundreds and hundreds of people. I'm not like, this is, I'm not the leader of this thing. I'm just a worker. So I was trying to run some, some software in collaboration with my colleagues, and I realized we had a supercomputer center down at the university. And that has a whole story in it too. Turns out that supercomputer center was funded by the Air Force to build a supercomputing center on Maui. So, UNM, New Mexico, were responsible for the Maui, the DOD Maui High Performance Computing Center. There's a whole story involved in that. But we ended up with a little version of that center at the university. And I discovered it in 1999, started going over there, started collaborating. And one thing led to another. I came aboard as staff as the deputy director. So I got big time into supercomputers, more than I'd ever imagined. I was there for seven years. I got the research grant that uh, Meredith was alluding to. I went off and did some independent consulting, which means I almost went broke and nearly destroyed my family's finances. And then I was lucky enough to get a job at Sandia. So, that's the short version, and then I can't talk about anything about that. So that's the short version of, of my life and how it connects onto all this. So I got thinking to myself, yeah, curiosity. So I've been interested in a lot of stuff. Did this curiosity kill the cat of my laser-focused you know, career direction? I'm not, I'm not a, a real professor at UNM, and I wanted to be a real professor at some point. I'm fine, I'm fine with not being one, but did I knock myself off track by being interested in too much stuff? And that brings me to the core of the discussion today. Did curiosity kill Schrodinger's cat? Well, does curiosity kill cats at all? Well, okay, so now we have a little fun. Here's where I just, I just put together some props. Uh, let me see if I can find them. Okay, so I started like I always start with Google. And there's a, there's a supercomputer for you. I mean, don't, don't even get me started. Google is amazing. Um, but I typed in curiosity killed the cat. And the first thing I thought was, uh, the interesting, the reply was quite interesting. I have to get close here. Being inquisitive about other people's affairs may get you into trouble. Okay. <laughs> So I'm not going to dispute that one bit. <laughs> it still is fun. And uh, if you're a politician, this is part of what you do. Um, so, 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 uh, but, but, uh, but that's what the phrase originally meant. And I, I hadn't even thought about that. I just thought it was more generic than that. And then I thought, OK, what can I do next to amuse the audience? Well, I'll type the phrase into YouTube. OK, curiosity killed the cat. Now, anybody who spent any time putting stuff into YouTube knows that you are very likely, if the phrase is at all interesting, you're going to get a band. And not only did I get a band, I got band after band after band. It took me a while to actually find it, and some of them are frightening. Uh, uh, it took me a while to find a cat video, but I finally did. Here it is. And I started playing, and I'm like, you know, all right, I'll play it while I'm talking, because cats are cute, and they do the most amazing things. This guy, 
He's like a little proton going through an accelerator tunnel. He goes all the way across the closet on these, uh, and he does other fun stuff. And, and of course, because Google is now incorporating machine learning and artificial intelligence, once you find this cat video, it jumps to all kinds of conclusions about what other cat videos you like, might like to see. And uh, I don't even own a cat, so it's not necessarily very accurate. Here's eight signs your cat is trying to kill you. I'm not, I don't not have a cat. I'm not a, I'm not, I like turtles, okay? That's my thing. My dad loved turtles. I love turtles. Um, so anyway, I'll just keep that going while I try to find... Was there, was there a good part to this? I forgot. The cat never actually gets in too much trouble. It's just cute as heck, and it's messing up uh, all the clothes. Let's, let's spin ahead and see if it does anything bad. Oh, yeah. Okay. I don't know how it's the case, but there's a bird involved in this. Okay, so this cat is... I don't know how the bird got out. Did the cat open the cage? I have no idea. This is actually a pretty good video, I guess. It's just got lots of deep questions in it. You know, what is a bird and a... Why isn't the cat attacking the bird? It goes on and on. So I'm going to stop this because otherwise you'll just say, look, just leave it there. Let's just let it finish. Okay. All right. So, so I tried again. I typed in curiosity into, and, and I got another hit. It's a strong desire to know or learn something. Okay. That's not shocking. A strange or unusual object or fact. Well, that's sort of interesting. I mean, one of the things I learned in this exercise is the um, connotations associated with curiosity that I hadn't much thought about. So we maybe are more curious when something is weird. Um, and by weird, I mean, this is actually really important. Um, one of my many side interests has to do with uh, how rare is novelty and when should people be using the term genius. Um, I'll tell you my quick opinion. I think few people should use the term genius. I think only historians should really be allowed to use it. I think it's possible geniuses might be able to recognize one another, although geniuses can barely put their clothes on some days, so I'm not sure that, that applies. I am not able to declare somebody a genius with any seriousness. I can, I can say it in, in passing, but uh, genius is rare, and I think novelty is rare. Despite the fact that we live in this outrageous technological age with all this cool stuff, if you know something about history, and I've been studying the Civil War recently precisely because of what happened early in the past, you know, people taking down statues and stuff, I realized, you know, I don't know much about the Civil War. So I actually pulled up, it's great, Yale professor David Blight is teaching an open course out of Yale on the history of the Civil War. I strongly encourage you to listen to it. I fall asleep to it every night, and at this rate, I'll get through it in about five years. But I've already learned a ton, and one of the things I've learned is so much of what's going on today has come around multiple times, and we've been through much worse, and we'll probably get out of this until we don't. And that's a different look, the black swan, which some of you may be familiar with, because when the real black swan comes along, we won't get out of it. And I will tell you that I'm proud to work at an institution that takes very seriously the business of keeping certain black swans from being that black swan. You're never gonna, if, if, if I have anything to do with it, and thousands of people I work with have anything to do with it, there may be black swans, but they won't come from the field of nuclear physics, let's just put it that way. So um, that's, I mean, it's very serious business and they're, you know, anyway, so, uh, so unusual. So you get curious when you kind of recognize something that's unusual, but in order to recognize a thing that's unusual, you have to recognize something. And sometimes things are so new that you don't even recognize them. There's a person, anybody heard of Jim Crutchfield by chance? He was associated with the Santa Fe Institute. He has a, a I think it's a fairly obscure paper, and it comes completely from a computer science -y point of view. But he discusses um, how to identify when something is new. And it's a really interesting, you know, if you're into reading obscure computer science papers by people you've heard of, <laughs> look up a paper by Jim Crutchfield on when, is, when are things new. And this is, not unusual, this is not irrelevant because artificially intelligent algorithms should be looking for new stuff. And so how would they identify it? And, and when can they not identify new things? All kinds of it. So, okay, so there's a million things on that slide that I didn't count on. So this is all part of the random walk. Let's see what else I found. Curiosity. Um, the desire to learn or know about anything, a curious, rare, novel thing, a strange, curious thing, archaic, carefulness, fastidiousness. That one I thought was kind of interesting. I've never heard the word curious used in that respect, but I can tell you that in science and in engineering of any system, but especially not apps on your cell phone, most of which are poorly engineered in my humble opinion, but in, in, in things that you fly on airplanes, in the airplanes themselves, and things you drop from airplanes, and things uh, that, uh, in the physics that goes behind things you drop from airplanes, and all kinds of other better stuff. You have to be exceedingly careful, fastidious, and skeptical. Okay, so this gets into um, um, other elements I want to touch on here. Oh my God! So, but that's okay. I got I got five hours worth of stuff. I'm just randomly floating through what I've got. Um, skepticism is something that I think we could all use a bit more of in our society right now. And I say that without revealing in any sense what my political leanings might be. Both sides need to be skeptical. I, it dawned on me yesterday. This is just a thought passing. You know, we have this problem with bots. 
And it looks like maybe the Russians have been doing information warfare against us by taking the most extreme views that get expressed in the social media and amplifying them and kind of pushing them toward the center. So about half the world is involved in social media. I'm the other, I'm in the other half, I have to say. I have a Twitter account, I have one follower, I've posted three posts in five years, and all three of them were posted before I had the one follower. So that's it. And I'm on LinkedIn, which is compulsory, but that's also badly out of date. Um, so in the half of the world that's paying attention to social media, there's a big problem right now with artificially intelligent entities getting on there with bad or being driven by bad intentions and amplifying crazy ideas and pushing those crazy ideas kind of toward the middle of thought. And so there's always going to be people, and God, I was so upset. I have kids in school. The shooting in Florida, one more complete calamity, okay? But the fact that there would be people on either side of the political spectrum willing to suggest that it was a government plot to take people's guns away, okay, that is an extreme position. I happen to be much more libertarian on guns than I used to be when I was, when I was young. I might get one myself someday. But the point is this, the government, in my opinion, is not having school shootings so they can take people's guns away. That is an extreme, irrational position based on no data and extreme ideological beliefs and frankly, a bad chemical brain balance. But the fact is the Russians can take that and they can move, they can talk with those people, they can connect those people to other people, and they can move that kind of nutty thinking, make it a little bit watered down and move it toward the center until pretty much soon everybody's having these thoughts. And I would just say this, be extremely skeptical at the following level. Every single person you may be following on social media might actually be a bot. You, this is like the ultimate solipsism. You might be the only one on social media and the rest of us might all be bots. That's the way I think about the world and, and now's a good time for me to, to transition to something. But you're still connected to curiosity. How many people recognize this? Okay, I didn't think many people. So I get this thing down in Albuquerque, and apparently it doesn't even, I'm sorry it's so small. Um, I'd have it speak for itself, but um, it, it, uh, it's called Marketplace, and it's just a collection of advertisements and little articles. And I love to read this thing. I get it, and I take it into the bathroom with me, and, uh, and so I, I, uh, I stumbled across the following advertisement recently. And I literally did this analysis. So again, I, I wanted to scan this, and it really isn't that important. And if you're not a cat person, and if you're a dog person, there's a nice picture here. I'll kind of highlight it, okay? There's a nice picture here of a dog. All right, I only have two hands. All right, and it's uh, uh, from, a, from a, a company called Sin Law, and they're trying to sell you synthetic lawn, and that's fine. And there's this big, beautiful, what is that? Uh, what kind of dog is that? But, slobbery. Slobbery, yes. <laughs> but down here it says, like a little, it's, it's even, um, when is it? What's the little symbol? Uh, oh, a, a, a registered trademark. What's in your turf matters. Now, it occurs to me now that if they're selling fake turf, that's like a whole other level of the question. It's like what polysynthetic chemical, who knows what that you don't want to skid across is in your turf if you buy their product. But a lot of people have fake lawns and it's good stuff and just don't play baseball on it, I think, because if you slide, you're going to be burned for, for a week. But mainly, I'm looking at this and I just pass it by and I'm like, what's in your turf matters? Now here's the difference between a curious and a non-curious mind, maybe. I thought about this, and then I thought, wait a minute, what am I thinking? And so I wrote down what I was thinking. What's in your turf matters, an analysis. Okay, I stared at it, was confused, didn't know why I was confused, and I wandered through the quick little analysis. Then I realized why I was conf confused, and the hint is here, for people who know me, this is me. My wife said, don't, don't read this. She said, don't show this. <laughs> I wanted to rewrite it in a scientific, active form. What's in your turf matters. To my brain, to the normal brain might mean the composition of your turf makes a difference to the outcome of your lawn. Now already I'm off the path because this is a fake lawn, but if you have a real lawn, it's certainly true that the composition of your turf matters to the outcome of your lawn. A slightly more friendly version of that would be your turf's composition makes a difference. So this is all completely in line with what they're trying to say. Then I realized, oh, but they're speaking in the passive. So what they were really trying to say is that which comprises your turf makes a difference. Or more shortly, that which is in your turf matters, or in short, what's in your turf matters. That's how they got to their statement. Here's what my brain did. What's in your turf dash matters? What is in your turf matters? That's how my brain thought about it, because I'm a very curious person, and when I see the word what, that is an, uh, here's where the parts of speech, that's a different parts of speech in their version than in my version. What What's in your turf matters. Now as a particle physics, like, well, it's matter. So the first thing I should do is yank up some of that turf and put it in a particle accelerator and hit it with a, right? But the point is, I completely misinterpreted the statement. What's in your turf matters? 
whereas they meant what's in your turf matters. I don't know very many people who make that mistake. I don't know if any of you would have made that mistake. And as I say, my wife, I don't know why she married me, but she said, don't, don't tell them that. But that's how I think about things. My, I'm so pathologically curious that when I see a statement like that, the what jumps off and causes me to completely misinterpret the English. So anyway, um, the, I need to get to the Schrodinger's cat part, and, and I have to show an obligatory New Yorker cartoon just to close out. I mean, you know, whenever you're stuck, show a New Yorker cartoon. So here's kind of a cartoon representation of an atom smasher, and it says the atoms are burned on the outside, but they're still ice cold in the middle, which sounds like some kind of a good, uh, good, uh, good dessert, yes. And, uh, and by the way, here's two more cat things I just couldn't resist. Uh, this is a still photo, the only thing I actually found recently. Here's a cat sitting on top. I just happen to never have owned an Apple product, but a cat sitting on my keyboard would be like a death wish for a cat. You know, don't be sitting on my keyboard. But the cat can ultimately get even because of this cartoon. There's the kitty at heaven, and because there's no separate kitty heaven, in order to get in here, you have to adopt a cat. <laughs> so I, I thought that was cute. Um, but, uh, but to get back to the, so this is the, this is one of the advertisements for this thing. And this got back to the question of, did curiosity kill Schrodinger's cat? Well, this whole business with, now let's see, how much more, I want to be careful, how much more time do I, do I have? Five, perfect, I can do it. I'll just talk twice as fast. No, um, so Schrodinger's cat is about connecting elementary particle type stuff to the macroscopic world. We are made up of trillions and trillions and trillions and trillions of atoms and protons, neutrons. If you think of us in, a, in the sense of, of blowing us apart and seeing what comes out, right? Um, it's less obvious that we're made up of all those things if you think more holistically. And that was at the core of the Schrodinger cat paradox. So Erwin Schrodinger was one of the uh, people heavily involved in the, the deep thinking that took place in the uh, early part of the 20th century. Can't believe I'm saying that. I was born in the 20th century. Um, and Erwin Schrodinger uh, eventually, in, in, uh, in uh, speaking with Einstein and Bohr and, and uh, others, came up with this uh, very simple paradox. Connected with these particle collisions I've been talking about are radioactive decays. And a radioactive decay is not unlike a particle collision. If, if you collide two particles, which, which way do they bounce? First time they may bounce this way, the next time they may bounce that way. And it turns out why they decide to bounce one way or another is not as simple as you might think. It's not like hitting baseballs. If you hit baseballs to each other and they hit at a certain, if they hit head on, they're going to blow up. If they hit off center, they're going to bounce in a way that depends on how off center they were. But in particle physics, when you collide these things together, they're actually elementary particles. They have no internal structure. They are like points. And the fact that you get them hit at all is kind of mysterious. But when they scatter, they scatter in different ways that are not really deterministic. And in the same way, a, a, a radioactive nucleus, when it decides to decay, that's not deterministic. You set up a bunch of them, and you characterize it by what's called a half-life. And what it just basically means is over a certain amount of, over one half-life, when you set up those radioactive atoms, on average, if you do this 100 times, on average, half of them will have decayed after a half-life. But when any single one of them will decay, no one is able to predict. And in particular, if you can't predict when an atom will decay, then suppose you take a poor cat and you put him in a box with some poison. You close up the box, the cat's alive because the poison isn't opened yet, and you connect the opening of the poison back to a detector that will open the poison when the radioactive particle decays. You set that up, you put the cat in, the cat's alive, you close the door, you move the radioactive particle next to the detector, and now you wait. Uh, you don't put a Geiger counter there, so you don't know what's happening. You just know that you've got, and, and again, very idealized, you've got one radioactive particle. It's going to decay with significant probability it'll decay within one half lifetime. If you wait longer, it's more likely to decay. If, you wait, if, it's, if it's a short-lived radionuclide like you use in medicine, you wait a week, it's going to have decayed. It's all gone. Well, after a while, if the particle decays, it opens the poison, the cat dies. If the particle hasn't decayed yet, the poison doesn't open, the cat's still alive. But it turns out in quantum mechanics, the way we describe mathematically, the way the theory came to describe the state of that radioactive particle, is that it's both decayed and undecayed at the same time. And this is where the central mystery begins. So there's two mysteries. Why is it like that? And, and the whole issue of how we came to that theory is such a long conversation I couldn't begin. I'm not qualified to do the history properly and, and it would take forever. But how we came to that model is because older models didn't work in, in the area of atomic physics and spectra. You had to come up with quantum mechanics as the only way to come up with formulas that properly described what's happening in the atomic realm, specifically in atomic spectra. 
And so in quantum mechanics, you mathematically describe a single particle as being both decayed and undecayed in a very mathematically specific way. But you don't describe cats like that. For those of you who have cats and love them, it's very traumatic to lose a pet. I've had a lot of friends with pets, dogs, cats, even fish for kids. Pet dies, very traumatic. So it's not trivial for a cat to be alive or dead. But when you set up this experiment, mathematically, it was not understood. And frankly, it's still not understood. I'll get to that in a moment. Whether that cat, now that you close the door, is in this weird state where it's both alive and dead at the same time. Because it's now correlated, its life is correlated with the decay or not decay of that single particle, which is well described by quantum mechanics. So, you know, once you open the box to see, now you've made an observation. And that's the other piece of quantum mechanics that is very mysterious. Once you make an observation, it is possible that you are changing the outcome. So if you open the door and the cat's still alive, that would be equivalent to making a measurement on the, on the elementary particle. And that measurement finds the elementary particle, the, the radioactive nuclei, still undecayed. And by making a measurement, you disturb it. And maybe either you decay it right away or you prevent it from decaying. Many, many details. But the bottom line is, when you make measurements, in the microscopic realm, it can change things. So the question is, can it do that in the macroscopic realm? Can we connect an individual particle up to a cat like that? And let me tell you, so, here's another way to interpret the title of my talk. Did curiosity, curiosity of the physics community of brilliant minds who have been thinking about this for 100 years, I do not consider myself among them, I'm just telling you a story. Have these brilliant minds figured out this problem? Has that curiosity killed the problem of the Schrodinger's cat? That's one possible interpretation for my title. So, in 1980, so that Carl Caves that I made a mention of, his advisor's advisor, what we call his academic grandfather, was uh, John Wheeler, famous physicist. Um, Wheeler and another person that some of you may know, Wojcik Zurich, he spent some time in Los Alamos, they put together a collection of papers and they published them. This was published in 1980. It's called Quantum Theory and Measurement. I've had this on my shelf since the 1980s, and I have really never read a significant fraction of it. And even had I done that, I don't think I could have understood much of it until now for all kinds of reasons. But I will tell you this. I talked to Carl, and Carl's very busy, didn't have a lot of time to talk about this, but I got the impression from his feedback that really, and he knows the field very well. I mean, he's been a pivotal, um, it, pivotal in, in the use of quantum mechanics and detecting gravitational waves. Um, his opinion was that there had not been a volume like this put together uh, since then. And this was, was rumination. And there is a book that came out very recently that he referred me to. And in fact, I will, I will sort of pass it along since he passed it along to me. I actually probably don't have it on my screen, but I can certainly pass it along to you. Where a serious academic has revisited what all the thinking has been uh, in the last uh, however many years, 30 years plus now that it's been since the 1980s. But I will give you, I'll tell you what, I scan, and this is where I just ran out of time trying to prepare this talk. I pulled up papers, I photocopied pieces of the book, I highlighted them, I read a little bit in my copious spare time, I thought about it, and I decided, you know what, if I was a betting person and I had to bet, I would say that no working physicist today will still admit 110 years plus past the uh, original birth of the field that we still understand this simple thing. So, has... Has a curiosity beaten Schrodinger's cat to death? Yes. <laughs> Has curiosity killed the Schrodinger's cat problem? No. And both those things are true at the same time, which I personally love because that's like a, you know, it's like a holographic metaphor. So you know what? I'm going to stop because I've got uh, many, many more things. Let me see if I'm missing anything profound I could have shown you. Yeah, there's one. Okay, so there's, there's three, three other quick things, real quick. Two of them are completely off the point, but I'll come back. Okay. One of them... Oh, yes. Yeah, I spent enough time with this that I just have to show you because it's so simple. Um, there are many corrections that I would like to see made in the world. Here's one of them. Okay, anybody know what that is? Atom. Everybody knows it as an atom. Well, a symbol for an atom. That's good, too. And this is actually accurate in one way, which is that you can't even see on the scale of the atom, which by today, if you pay attention to chips, we're down to like seven nanometers. Well, an atom is about a third of a nanometer or half a nanometer in diameter in some sense. On the scale of that, you can't even see the nucleus because the nucleus is 10,000 times smaller. So keep that number in mind, 10,000. Okay, so then I find another symbol. Ooh, now they got the electrons in there. This is both good and bad. First thing is an electron is a point particle. So on any scale that matters to you in any ordinary way that you want to think about it, how we even touch point particles, you could argue, how do you even do that? And the answer is it's quite subtle, but on this scale, the electron is not a big blob, but okay. It's making the thing a little bit better. 
Now I found this one. Okay, well, the electrons aren't visible, but that's okay because they're really tiny even on the scale of an atom. And now they got the nucleus in there. Great! Except it's 10,000 times too big. Okay, so that's not a good accurate representation either. Okay, then I finally found one that has both the electrons at the wrong size and the nucleus at the wrong size, but here at least they're being honest. They're empty. Okay, so it's like, eh, I don't really mean to put them there, but I just put them. So all of these symbols of, of, of uh, electrons are way outmoded. Let me show you what electrons look like to um, people nowadays. Okay, periodic table, all the structure you're going to see comes from the same regularities that, um, there's another good one. Oh, that's, I meant to hit that. Oh, if it were only so simple. <laughs> right? Um, here is a little table of some elements, and here's the so-called electron shell structure. And you can see that there are multiple shells. They have numbers, one, two, three, four, five, and then each shell has some letters, uh, S, P, uh, D, F, and so forth. I, on the only social medias I engage in, I use this little symbol. This is what an electron orbital actually looks like. It's a very strangely shaped probability distribution, which, you know, I have actually the program running on my screen here if people are interested to be able to uh, see some of these things in some detail. This is computed on the fly on my computer. And the dots represent probability density. They don't represent particles. And then once you compute it, you can then spin around. And I'm happy to share this. Uh, this is not my software. I just discovered this a long time ago and love it. This is what atoms actually look like to each other in terms of interactions. And this one I use as my symbol because it turns out there is no atom in existence that has a 6F0 shell. So I picked 6F0 because the quantum theory can compute shells up to n equals infinity. So this is, <laughs> this is what I use in my social media for my picture. <laughs> It's a 6F0 orbital, uh, and, um, and my point is that nowadays, in order to do semiconductors, anything advanced with material science, this is how the computers and the people think about atoms. They do not think about them um, as those little lines because uh, the whole idea of space is not ordinary in quantum mechanics. Things don't have position. Uh, when a thing has a position, that actually is weird. What's ordinary in quantum mechanics is that they don't have a position. And again, I could go on and on and we could talk, and I hope, I hope that we do. Um, uh, let's see, anything else I got in here? No. So what I'd like to do, I could, I could ramble forever, but I, 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 I guess I want to finish up with the following. One of the things I thought about is that cre uh, curiosity involves at least some amount of creativity because you have to ask questions and you have to make up questions to ask. And very often, it's possible to have questions that don't make any sense. So there, are, there can be wrong questions, but any question is a good question. You start with a, right, every teacher says it. There are no bad questions. They need to take it seriously so that when somebody does ask a bad question, you deal with that, you work with it. So you have to be creative to come up with the questions. Then you have to be courageous to ask them. And then you have to not be afraid of whatever answers you get. And those combinations of creativity, courageousness, and, and no fear, that to me is at the core of, of uh, curiosity. And um, those are three very hard things to come by. Um, I don't know which of them are gifts, which of them you can build. I mean, I don't consider myself a terribly courageous person, but I did come up here and make up a talk in front of you, so I can't be a complete <laughs> coward. So anyway, I'm over time as usual, and uh, I appreciate your attention, and let's talk some more.